Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. Borag Thung, Athletes, and welcome to the latest episode of the 2080 Thrillcast, the official podcast of the galaxy's greatest comic. I am your host, as always, Mark Char. And in this episode, we're talking about the 2080 Sci Fi Special, which is out now from all the news agents and the 2080 Shop and App. Um, this is a crossover event where uh, Judge Dredd and lots of Dread World characters come together in one overarching narrative over several stories. And on this episode, we've got uh, the uh, the Machiavellian plotters behind this uh, this experiment, which is uh, writers Michael Carroll and Maura McHugh, who uh, should be no strangers to regular listeners of the 2080 Thrillcast. So we, we dive into a little bit about the project, how it came about, um, how they have uh, worked to coordinate with the other creatives on board. And uh, it... it, it if you're able to get a copy, uh, whether it's print or digital, then it's definitely worth your time. Really fascinating to see how the, all the different bits fit together. So great to hear from them. Uh, thank you, as always, for the suggestions that have been coming in on the email, which is Thrillcast. That's all one word, thrillcast at 2080.com. Um, Still working on some of those suggestions for uh, future interviews. Uh, in seven days' time, we're going to be hearing another classic episode from the Thrillcast, which is, uh, well, since uh, Ben Wheatley's got a new film out, uh, perhaps it's time to revisit him. So we go back uh, to chat to him. It was around about the time of High Rise, um, his adaptation of the J.G. Ballard novel, that uh, we had a chat with him uh, about his Love of 2000 AD. So uh, that'll be in seven days' time. Uh, in the meantime, if you're starved of fiddle power, make sure you go along to shop.2080.com to uh, check out the latest releases coming from 2000 AD. Um, also, uh, if you go along to the website, 2080.com, there's uh, actually further interviews with uh, Mike and Maura, plus also the other people involved in the, uh, the 2080 sci-fi special, which includes David Bailey, um, James Newell, Anna Morozova. Great to hear from them and to dig down into uh, what is actually a major undertaking to do, like a, a multi-character crossover set in the world of Dread. So uh, let's crack on and hear from Mike and Maura about uh, the thinking and the process and the, uh, the consequences, the consequences, outcome of uh, their work on the 2080 sci-fi special. So let, let's talk the uh, 2080 sci-fi special because it's been out for a, a week now. Um, yeah. And I, I want to get you both on because uh, this is something a little bit different. It's, it's, it's a crossover. Now, um, 2080 is, uh, has occasionally dipped its toe in the crossover waters. So, you know, various characters have made sure that Dredd has met Kurt Coburn and Armitage and Devlin War uh, separately. But this is really bringing them together in, in an overarching narrative. I, I wanted to start off by asking uh, how this came about, whether this was something that, that uh, Tharg approached you both to do or this was it something that had been percolating away for a little while? Well, yeah, Matt... Tharg, the mighty Tharg, um, approached us and uh, though Mike and I had started talking during the first lockdown about doing something together, uh, just privately, and um, I think at some point I might have mentioned that to Matt in an email, um, just that we were discussing things. And I don't know if that sort of lodged in the back of his head. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he came to us and uh, it was a case of I didn't... You know, you just have to do something like this when you're offered it. Yeah, yeah it was too good an opportunity to uh, to, to turn down. I mean, the, yeah, obviously as a freelancer, if the editor says, can you, the answer is always yes. And then you go, can we? Yes, yes, you can. Yes. <laughs> but in, in this case, because more and more and I are both really familiar with, with uh, Dread and the Dread world in general, um, but, but from kind of from different angles, um, it was a great chance to sort of have a, a meeting of, of our two minds and, and the ways in which um, 
we want to see dread going forward. Um, also, one thing that was particularly of, in, of interest to, to me, and I think tomorrow, was that we in 2000 we've never had this um, the idea of, of all the creators, gay or writers in particular, getting together, have a big meeting to steer the future, or at least to have some ideas of where the future might be going. So we've never had that, and this was a a, a way to do that on a, a um, on a smaller scale, maybe a, a test mm-hmm. level. And uh, I think it worked pretty well. Um, uh, more than I had, uh, yeah, as, as, as you said, we've been bouncing ideas back and forth for quite some time. So we didn't necessarily use any of those ideas, but it, this gave us a good chance to um, to see how, how well the collaboration works. Mm, yeah, my, um, Mike and I were, were we've been t- talking for quite a while about the thing. Wouldn't it be great if the 2000 AD writers could have some giant meeting <clears throat> once a year. I believe they do this in some of the big, <laughs> uh, the other comic studios who shall not be named. <laughs> yeah, no, the non-independent um, ones, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I believe they do that on some of the big um, characters, you know. Um, and so the chance to work with other 2000 AD writers was uh, fantastic. And then, you know, I personally would have loved to have the same uh, interaction with the artists, but it's actually quite a complicated situation to put all of this together. And like Mike and I got such a small insight into uh, how difficult Matt's job is. Uh, and that's only for one special, you know, um, but it would be great, I think, to have more uh, communication going on between the writers. And though, you know, maybe some people just don't want, you know, to be fair, they may, may not want to hear anything about what anyone else is doing. But in this case, it made perfect sense. It was great. Um, and we really ran with the ball once Matt handed it to us. Um, and now he did say the different characters that he wanted to work with. Um, and it was his idea to put Devlin and um, Armitage together. Brilliant, because I'm a big fan of grumpy couples, you know, the odd couple kind of scenario. And I think Liam did such a terrific job in that dynamic, um, you know, yeah. so, yeah, it, it, you know, so and then with Chopper as well in Inaba, he asked us, these were the characters he wanted to work with and uh, Dredd and Anderson, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the basic idea came from Matt. He said he wanted to do something on a more... Oh, I don't want to spoil it too much, but a, a global threat, mm-hmm. if you like, to some degree. And we could have gone down the road of having aliens or, or I don't know, uh, ancient Mesopotamians who invented time travel and they want to conquer the future. Damn, that's good, actually. We're doing that one next. But we, <laughs> we, we came up with, the, the, what we came up with basically was more, a more credible threat. It also has some resonance to what's happening in the world today. Um, but it, it was interesting, the, much as we were going on with it, we were sort of realizing we're not giving a lot of space to the other characters. This is what I was thinking because we sort of divide up into Dread. Dread has to have a big chunk at the beginning because everybody expects Dread, and he got a ten-page chunk, and then the other characters got um, six-page chunks, and then Anderson, which uh, Mora wrote, got another ten-page chunk, and we wrapped it up with ten pages at the end, and we thought, yeah, we're really hogging the blankets here with this one. But then it's our bed. <laughs> so um, it was, uh, uh, we got, I really got a, a, a buzz to um, to see a lot more of the supporting characters. I want to see what happens. What has what Anaba been up to for the past 10 years? Yeah. Where is she going from here? Um, people who, who are new enough to 2008 might not, or did Dread's World, might not really realise who she is and who, what her history is and how she, else, how she started. But... Uh, I mean, there's the character that we really have to see. How did she, how did she cover the ten years or so? I think it was ten years since she last appeared. Because Dread stories still age in real time. Mm-hmm. So as if she, if the character hasn't been in the comic for a number of years, then that time is she's not sitting there idly by twiddling her thumbs, and nor is she um, skipping ahead. It's not like a, the old Spider-Man thing where he's he's always been Spider-Man for about five years now. That kind of thing. <laughs> it's it's. Because uh, was it forty four years now since since it was twenty ninety nine in Mega City One? Well, that makes I'm going to do my mental maths here. That makes it the year twenty forty three or thereabouts. Actually, I'm I'm, I'm cheating because I have that written down on a little notepad because <laughs> I never remember. But so 
when we look at someone like Armitage, he started in 1990 mm. and he was already an old guy. He was at least my age now. So now that's, I'm 55. So, I mean, that's like makes him at least 85. Mm. Um, uh, you know, so we've got to see, you know, what, what's he able to do from now on? Um, Devlin Moore, of course, cheats by being a vampire and therefore not aging. But uh, yeah, so it's tremendously good fun to, to do this, to have the, um, the little window into their lives. And hopefully we get to see them again because the, the writers and, uh, and the artists have done amazing work on this. And uh, I mean, I really loved what um, David um, Bailey did with um, Chopper. And then Tom Foster was just so fantastic. I mean, David's script came in and Mike and I were like, oh, yes, this is <laughs> this is the kind of script we want to see come in the, in the door. And uh, so it's really nice when you get that. And then um, Tom really did the business. I was so happy. And the coloring and the lettering. I mean, it's all a whole, um, you know, it's a whole uh, team effort indeed. Uh, though, I mean, Tom's put up a couple of processes if anyone was interested on his Twitter. So you can see a couple of panels where you can see his um, going from pencils to inks. And he's, it's like really, I, I love looking at stuff like that. I think it's really great. But, uh, and I think Chopper is a great character. He's not one I was super familiar with, or in ABBA, in fact. I had to do some research on, uh, on both of them. Um, but I just loved what he did with them and uh, the, the hair and the, you know, yeah. it's just, well, that was Tom, but it was written that way, let's say. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was, I just, I just thought there's a real sort of joyfulness to Chopper. And I think sometimes with Dread, you just, you know, with the 2018 <laughs> universe, you really do need these like injections of <laughs> fun. And, you know, because sometimes the future can be fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's a great contrast as well. If, if the future is always dystopic and it's always dour, it can be hard to hurt uh, ending. But when you see someone like Chopper who's facing horrible situations, but he's still enjoying life to some degree that's great I actually the same with Devon Wall as well because Devon Wall won't let anything get him down because he kind of traipses along having a great time and knowing that nothing can hurt him which is, mm. is pretty cool so uh, yeah I, I, I'd say the other creatures have done an amazing job especially um, I have to dip the hat to Carl Sock and to um, David because they they base our um, Liam Carl and Liam because they they're they're new mm. relatively to 2000 AD comparatively anyway I mean obviously David Bailey's been working on um, 2000 for Yonks and he did yeah. the brilliant Wandering Soul uh, Chopper story which kind of this one's kind of a sequel to which I loved mm. um, but yeah I, I, I like that when we had our, our big meeting we, uh, we we weren't well hopefully we was just myself and Maura dictating the way things should be to the other writers I think we took their input on board, uh, or I think we gave the very good impression of giving taking the report on board, which is just as important, you know. Well, it, it, let's get down to brass tacks. How, how did you go about uh, framing this and, and, and forming this uh, idea in a way that things would move in the direction that you wanted, but you were also giving enough latitude to writers like uh, Liam and David and Carl. Um, so that they could do their own thing without being too prescriptive. How, how, how did you start that process? Yeah, well, Mike and I had, um, like we had so many discussions um, about this. And uh, I mean, as I said, uh, thank Targ for high-speed broadband. No, honestly. And it certainly saved me <laughs> during lockdown. And this happened during the third lockdown in Ireland. So I was delighted to have this um, regular kind of um, chatting with Mike. I think it actually really helped me save my mind <laughs> during, <laughs> during that period. Um, but yeah, so we sat down, um, well, well, we rang it on, uh, sort of rang doesn't even use isn't the correct term. We called each other and we figured out the narrative. Then we, um, I think Mike probably, because he's very like that, you know, hammered out a first draft of the narrative. Yep. And then I would go in and tidy it up and not, you know what I mean, Mike? I'm not saying. Made it good, yes. <laughs> yeah. Took the bad, took the bad bits out. <laughs> first drafts are always, um, you know, that's actually quite the hard work. So, um, 
then after that, what we did is we had an outline of each of the three stories of them. Like really, I'm talking very rough, uh, nothing terrible. What we thought would work within the bigger narrative. So then what we did is um, the other thing is we believed in real transparency for the writers. So we had a shared drive um, and we shared everything so that they saw all the process to see what was coming in. And similarly with all the scripts and all the art, they got to see everything. So it wasn't like we were just like holding a barrier between them. So what happened then is with the meeting, it was great because they had read the outline before the meeting. And then in the the Zoom, uh, this uh, big meetup we had, they, um, we just had a great fun because we just were knocking ideas around and they were very excited. I don't think I'm uh, making that up now about (laughs) to be uh, involved in the project. And then we let them, do it because they had to write the scripts, not us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to speak for the other writers, but they all thought I was awesome. So, <laughs> uh, no, we, what we, we did was we kind of, we had um, oh, like a black box approach to some degree. Now, this was the, the original idea was that we'd say, okay, we, this is kind of what we want to happen around your story. We want you to write about, say, an ABBA or, or, or arbitrage or whatever. And we'll let you do your own thing and then we'll come back and pick up the, the pieces at the end. But as it was, we we were we definitely get a bit more hands-on with all the stories saying, you know, hang on, we need to steer it here and it needs to go there. And we went back for rewrites and I'm sure that they hated us by the end of it. But we weren't doing it for our own egos. Um, we, we were basically, it was all to do with the good of the story. The story had to be the key thing. And um, if we were doing it again, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe a better approach might be, this was purely with hindsight, is to have them involved in the overall story design from the beginning. But as it was, we, we weren't thinking of those terms to start with. Also, when we, when we initially started, we didn't know who the other writers would be. Um, so we were kind of uh, far and blind there. But yeah, I think it works really well. Um, because all the other writers are very experienced in their fields, if it's not just comics, um, Liam is... Uh, tremendous experience elsewhere and as does Carl so they knew how to write but um, they weren't maybe weren't quite as familiar with writing comics whereas they barely was so we had um, we love a range of experience there and uh, yeah, we also had a bit of a time crunch because we didn't get this we kind of got this project a little late considering yeah. all the the spinning plates involved. Yes. Um, so we actually, we got into that narrative fast. Like we created that, um, the overall within a week, I think, of yeah. calls yeah. and and writing it. Yeah. And then, so the, the other thing that Mike is saying there is that we I kind of wrote the, the scripts came in sequentially. So, uh, and we designed it that way, partly so that we might need to pick up things from the other people's scripts. So, um, so it was a bit of an exquisite corpse going on, sort of. Um, so uh, once we knew the other writers uh, had the meeting, Mike straight away wrote the first script. And then we asked the other writers to have them in at certain, you know, at certain yeah. times. Yeah. Now I was, script, yeah. yeah, I was writing the Anderson script after all the three writers. So yeah. I'd seen all their scripts and we had actually gone through edits with them as well. So, um, and I wrote mine and then Mike and I co-wrote the last one. So there was a, there was actually a call and response going on uh, throughout the process. So it wasn't just like, um, so we were reacting somewhat to what to all that was going on in the in the previous scripts, and that was that's very enjoyable as a writer. I personally just enjoy that. Yeah, me too. It was weird because I'm so used to being solitary. I just write my ideas, fire them off, whether it's novels or whatever. And and because um, because you know uh, everything I do is perfect from the get go, I never get any feedback. So that's not entirely true, to be honest. But it definitely feels like um, this is something I would love to do again. Uh, on a different scale, though, I, I mean, I would like to do it on a a, a, a larger scale. I, I, to some degree, I've kind of done this with the judges' um, mm. novellas, um, just bringing that in for no reason, the fact that they're behind me there on the shelves. Um, 
where where I'm, we're kind of come up with a vague, I want I'm, I'm, in a vague sounds wrong. We come up with it with a a um, a slender outline, and so we kind of want the book to be about this, and then let the writer do their own thing, and we just make sure that they're not going too far off um, off the beaten uh, track, or indeed the, the it's okay, so the severely beaten track. So we just make sure that. You know, it, uh, uh, someone doesn't invent something that wouldn't have shown up in later Mega City One history. But in this case, we were definitely more hands on. I would, it'd be very interesting to do it on a different scale where Matt gave, I mean, sorry, the Mighty Tarek gave us complete freedom to pick the writers and the artists because, actually, no, that would be a bad idea because I would just pick me to do all the writing. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't trust myself, <laughs> but um, it would be interesting. But, but um, when we realised what we went through to get this thing off the ground, and Matt has to do it 60 times a year, at least. <laughs> How many of them are there? Can't be just one Matt Smith out there. There's, there's lots, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, he's cloned himself, I think. Oh, well, you, uh, the, the, the reason why that scene got cut from the Stallone film, you know, all the, all the clones, oh, it, it was a little bit too close to home because that's what the basement looks like at work. That makes sense. Of clones of Matt. <laughs> you know, when we wear out one, we, we crack out the other one. You know. At last, the plot tenons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is an interesting point about um, the, the, the art of editing is itself, I, 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 personally, I think it, it, it's vastly underrated uh, oh, yeah. In, yeah. In, in comics, you know, particularly um, as the, 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 the kind of notion of the auteur has, has really taken over the discourse around comics, you know, that yeah. the, 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 quite rightly, the, 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 the creators are, are the ones who, whose work it is. But a, a good editor is worth their weight in gold, if not more. Um, Absolutely. If, if, if not for, for, for just, you know, providing a, an extra pair of eyes, a guiding hand, but also just putting the damn thing together, you know, I, 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 I it it is sometimes miraculous to watch the prog to watch the meg uh come together so i guess this this was uh just a taste of as you say what happens 60 odd times a year um in in, in the office but I, i'm 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 interested in in your ex, your, your your uh the experiences that that, that you drew on for something like this, you know, you, you, you're both writers, you, 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 you've both worked in this world already in, in different ways. Um, were there particular uh, experiences or, or skills that you, that you find yourself drawing on that, that were unexpected in putting this together? Hmm. You're from uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, um, no, I, I don't think so, but I would say that I do have experience editing and uh, like uh, uh, Mike has got a tremendous amount as well. Um, and Mike, the great thing is if you have any questions about the 2000 AD universe, Mike generally knows the answer <laughs> to them. Well, because I just lie. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I there wasn't anything, it was... I've done a lot of organization of things, of events and stuff like that. So I think when you approach a project like this, it's like project management. It's just that simple. So if you're not organized, like um, one of the things my, uh, Mike and I did was create a spreadsheet, you know, <laughs> and you, you know, there's, that's re- this all comes, it's kind of really boring stuff that people don't realize, you know, and this was, our spreadsheet was small. I mean, Maths must have been much, much bigger <laughs> because we were only wrangling the writers and Matt was dealing with the artists and the colorists and the letterers. And then he has to put the whole thing to bed on top of it. Uh, so like we were only project managing one end of, of the thing. But uh, and I, I, I should stress, of course, that Matt did have an you know, an editorial eye on all the scripts. It wasn't like he just went, oh, yes, whatever, <laughs> you know. And we um, always appreciate that. Matt's got a great insight into stories. And um, I, you know, have depended upon that loads of times. Um, so I didn't, I, I, I think 
the drawing upon the the uh, project management part of things I have done in the past, but that doesn't even seem like anything new to me. You see, Mike, because that's like it's like breathing. It's like <laughs> I do it all the time, so it doesn't even seem like when I get a project like this, my automatic attitude is to uh, to to line it up and figure out. Is when you're working with other people, is to be very clear in communication. Um, you know, very responsive, and also to um, stress deadlines in this case, because again, we actually were a bit tight, and all the writers made their deadlines. Oh yeah, yeah, they did. Well, we we um, Memor and I both run conventions and things like that, and mm-hmm. work with committees. And the first thing I oh, I don't know, because back in my old life I was project manager uh various things I worked on and I've always had the the mantra that you make the the other people clear don't tell me you weren't able to do something tell me you won't be able to do something it's you you don't want to keep someone in the dark hope everything's going to work out okay because the work has to be done and um Ultimately, even if, if even if, for example, Maura and I had fallen out, or we'd fallen out with one of the others, I know which one as well. God, he was tough. But if <laughs> if this had happened, um, it would have been bad. But this key thing is still to get the product out on time, because in a year's time, people won't remember the struggle that they had getting a, a wrangling a writer or an artist or or getting the right sort of work out of them. The only thing that's left at the end is the finished product, which which Maura has there. She can hold up and show you. I haven't yeah. got one because they haven't sent me one yet. Yeah, it but, arrived arrived in the post to yeah. Ireland today, oh, west of Ireland today. So I'm great, great, my great enemy. Enemy. Yeah. But they, ultimately, that that's the, it's like with, with a movie um, where Matt would be the um, the director and producer, and we were like second assistant directors. Um, Mm-hmm. With a with a big badge that says I'm a second assistant director, ask me how. Um, <laughs> but we are we are effectively wrangling the talent too. But it's not really our show. But what the important thing is ultimately that it is the product at the end. That's mm. that's what's the that's the whole point. Um, so it's not about egos. It's not about uh, oh someone someone accused me online of um, oh, this was me attempting to take over uh, the Dread universe. <laughs> Going, what? <laughs> no, you, you don't want to uh, pay attention to what anybody says online, Michael. You should. No, know. I've 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 learned that. Yeah, apparently, actually, there's the that thing on the internet where it says check lies. It turns out to be off all the time by default. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it it is ultimately it's the key thing. We want people to look back and go, yeah, that was fun. Um, we don't need them to see the struggles and the trials and the you know the the pain involved. Or, or anything like that. It's not about the sto- uh, writers or the creators. It's about the story. Yeah. So we were like, that was the our main thing as well, is that we wanted everything to be as good as possible because we knew this was an, an unusual event for 2000 AD. Yeah. And so I probably worked harder on this than I have worked on anything in, uh, not that I <laughs> was, it was just... <laughs> It was important to me, not that I give lesser attention to other projects. I have to be careful here now. <laughs> but um, it, it just meant a lot to us that we were asked to do this. And it meant so we did try our best to do as good a job as possible. And I mean, even editing, like I was editing Mike's work. He was editing mine. You know, we weren't immune from critique um, and it was actually really great to have that input, um, even if you might occasionally go, you know, <laughs> you read the occasional comment, but usually, you know, Mike's right. So no, I don't. And I got to edit Mike, so that was good. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah, and I got to write Dread, which is great. You did get to write Dread. Yes, and I got to, to write Anderson. Anderson, yeah. I don't think I've ever done before. Even, you know, I've, I've written hundreds of episodes of Dread at this stage. And I don't think I've ever had Judge Anderson in there. Mm. Um, a couple of times I wanted this to include her and I was told, no, no, she's off limits at the moment or she was busy mm. or something like that. Or she won't work with me. She has an ego. But um, yeah, it was good fun. I, w- I would definitely, I'd love to do this again on a different level. I'd love it if Matt would say, hey guys, do the winter special and it doesn't have to be a linked story. It can be just random stories and that would be easier and that would be good fun. Yeah. But, uh, 
Yeah, we were we were talking about like um, where we would uh, weave a narrative based on other people's stories. So in that way, we would be responding and we would put an element of it, the overall story inside each of the contributors. That's one of the things we were chatting about. And that would be much more an exquisite corpse where we are responding to the work and not you know, establishing Mike, Mike's looking, hmm, yes, we did talk about it. I'm just wondering how, how long I can get away with not knowing what you mean by exquisite corpse. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, where someone said, oh, sorry, I should have stressed it. Okay. You know, where someone says a story and then the next person uh, writes a story in response to the first story. Oh, we used to call that a round robin thing. Brown, yeah, it's yeah. the same thing. Well, excuse me, Miss Posh, I've been Sorry. to play. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah. it's it's where you're working in response to other work. You've no set agenda. Right. Um, it's actually very freeing sometimes and it can be a bit uh, scary as well but the thing is you're always trying to challenge yourself as well I am always trying to challenge myself as a writer um, so yeah it was great that's actually one of the great things is, is it is a, a challenge to work with when you're not used to working with someone else to work with them and to to say to yourself no hang on a minute maybe their ideas are better you know I mean and because it is a very ego driven thing in a way to say I, you know, my words would go into other people's minds and therefore my words are the best words. But that's not necessarily true. Sometimes other people, you know, will come up with brilliant ideas. Well, I've, I mean, I've obviously I've learned that from working on the uh, the George's novellas and um, from working with the writers in general where I realised, you know, hang on, maybe, maybe I'm not the best writer in the world. And, you know, but that doesn't last long. Usually I go back to, yes, of course I am. But um, it, it is, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to... to to stand on their shoulders, as it were. Yeah. So, so if you guys come up with this, um, um, I think, God, oh, I wouldn't have gone down that road. I go, no, actually, no, kind of wish I had thought of that because, you know, these are, are great writers and great minds. And uh, I definitely think that for um, for the the, the the two newbies um, who are, are basically Carl and Liam, um, they're going to go a long way. You know, I mean, hopefully they go in the right direction, but they will go a long way. You know, <laughs> as long as they look back and, and remember where it all began. <laughs> I mean, on on this uh, special, you've you've got two alumni of uh, the Thought Bubble Talent Contest. You know, uh, Liam won the script competition, and James Newell, who who draws the final episode, yeah. uh, won the art competition the other year. Um, it, it's there aren't many opportunities for new talent to come through. You know, the the, the number of uh, future shocks that we publish a year by sheer necessity has, has, has gone down. Um, so with something like this, it's nice to see, you know, pe- pe- uh, people that we've actually gone, yeah, actually you're, you're good enough. Why not get, uh, get, get, give it a whirl? So I, I'm guessing from what you've just said that, that there wasn't any kind of need for, Mentorship or sort of holding hands? Uh, there was a bit. Yeah, but but I think um, well, I, mean, I, I don't want to single out any, any particular story, but there was one. There was one story that where we went through more iterations than I would have expected. But in that particular case, um, the the writer was brilliant, but just untamed. Um, and then we and we don't necessarily want tamed writers, but we want them at least to be heritable or steered. You know, you basically fire your energy in this particular direction, and for now, because we need to come out at the end of the story in a particular fashion. If it had been a totally um, free for all, and we didn't have to have an overall story arc, I would have been happy enough to let the writers go where they wanted to go. But we needed to go. Yeah, look, this is brilliant, but it's the wrong kind of brilliant today, mm. and. Um, Yes, yeah, so he's dead now. Um, no, he's not. Um, <laughs> I mean, this this was going to be one of my questions: is 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 that when um, you have an overarching narrative, you have a plan that you need to fit into, and you've already mentioned the um, the time constraints that you had. Can there sometimes be? Uh, can that breed a lack of spontaneity and and you know a, a need to, to 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 tack as close as possible to to, to the plan? Yeah. I'd say, um, yeah, there's a, there's a danger that, that, that we can become too constrained by, by the, 
the limitations I was saying, for example, that myself and, and Maura put on the on the story that the other writers were constrained. But I've always believed as a writer that that you can only um, you can only scale to new heights by climbing obstacles. If you have a totally free uh, playing field, you're not necessarily going to go anywhere. You've got to have you can you, yeah you got to have a challenge so that you can grow and um, I, I hopefully. This sounds like a really weak excuse in some ways, but by making things harder for the other writers, we made them better. And I'm so sorry because they were already brilliant to begin with. Um, maybe we didn't make them better. Maybe we hamstrung them. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, Maura, you, you've got much more experience working with proper writers than I do. How do you feel? Oh, would you stop? Um, no, but I actually, I, I don't think we really constrained them at all. We just said, this is the rough outline. We had a great conversation. They wrote what they wanted to then and then came back to us. And on a couple of them, we just had to steer them, uh, you know, in the right, it, just for the sake of uh, narrative, um, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't onerous and it wasn't uh, uh, that terrible. The thing that Mike is saying is absolutely the case is that if you have a, if you have a blank canvas, that's much harder. I actually find it in some ways, limitations are actually much easier to work within because your mind bounces off the limitation and uh, often you might try to sneakily get around it just to uh, be sly, you know, but it causes you to be inventive. Um, so, I, I mean, someone funny enough, when you were talking, Mike, I was thinking that somebody had recently just told me a story about someone they had worked with in comics who had uh, was supposed to be writing a graphic novel and it, he checked in with them recently and it was four years later and he still hadn't it done. And this is someone who has the blank canvas and has no deadline and has no urgency and has, so everything else is going to get in your way of doing the project and you'll invent every excuse in the world. Deadlines um, can be awful, but uh, with 2000 AD, they're not mutable. Like uh, we may have leeway in other projects we work on, but with comics and production, you don't like, you have to get them in on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were quite upfront about that. And we weren't, again, we weren't evil. We weren't anything. We just said, look, and in fact, I think we got our scripts in a week ahead of time. I think all the scripts were done. Oh yeah. Um, we, were, yeah. we were early. Yeah. We, we did do that trick of, of lying to the other writers about how much time they had, but they don't know that <laughs> until now. <laughs> but yeah, but I would absolutely, the key thing is that um, if you want to be seen as a professional, deliver on time. I mean, I know that people like uh, Douglas Adams and Alan Moore or whoever are notorious for late scripts or whatever, maybe not Alan, but some people have their, they admire their writer for heroes who, who never deliver on time. And I go, yeah, really? Yeah, I'm not sure that's their good thing in the end, you know? Mm -hmm. Deliver your work on time or tell them why you won't deliver on time. Not, don't just sit there and hope the deadline will you know, whiz by unnoticed. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I think um, we... I think we, my, I certainly learned a lot from this process about storytelling because having to read other people's scripts and analyse what works in those scripts and what I need to do to to keep them working while making them work with the overall story. That was something I've never really done to this level, not for a very long time. Mm. It was good. Yeah, I, I would definitely do it again for more money if uh, <laughs> the opportunity came up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did not make a fortune out of this, you know. No, no. It's like the old Porsche out there, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was an awful lot of extra work. Um, yeah. We do, uh, we, I think we did too much more. I think we were too kind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's just because we wanted it to be the best uh, project it could be. And it was really nice to see the art coming in. Um, and, you know, I mean, to be partisan, I was really, really happy with Anna's artwork on the Anderson uh, story. I had, we had not really a lot to say about the artist. Matt has his magical spreadsheet that, his giant magical spreadsheet that he works off. But I had mentioned her and I said, oh, you know, I really like her work. And then Mike said, you know, we were like, oh, you know, wouldn't she be great to put into the project? And 
Also, she was very excited and passionate about doing it. And she had not done an Anderson, like one of the big characters before. So um, it's really nice when you work with someone who, uh, and I was lucky because I knew her very tiny amount. So we were able to connect and I love doing that, being able to talk to the artist and to give them an open door and say, here, you may please come talk to me. Um, and, and so she was like showing me pencils and stuff. Uh, we didn't get that with every artist. Um, so it, in my case, I was lucky with Anna and uh, because I had that connection. Um, but uh, yeah, I love it. And, and usually all I'm saying is, Fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's very rare. I'm like, I, every, if I work with an artist and I spot something small, I usually say, well, I think that detail is slightly wrong, but um, generally I'm there to just uh, clap <laughs> enthusiastically. Uh, and Anna was just, she was just, you know, uh, um, she was just enthusiastic, passionate, loved the characters and I loved her style. So yeah, I was, I was lucky in, in that regard. Oh yeah, we, we, we were very lucky with the arts. I was, I mean, they were all brilliant, but I got a real buzz when I found out that, uh, that uh, Robert Smith was going to be drawing the Armitage and, and Devon Wall story because obviously I'm a fan from 2000 from the very, very, very beginning and I've never had a chance to work with Robin anymore. And it's like, oh, oh, oh yes, yes. That's one off the, uh, off the must work with list, you know? Yeah. So Real boss and um, oh, Neil Gouge is in Abbo is yes, yeah. like, it's a pretty brilliant amazing. stuff. Yeah. Like, they, um, yeah. I have to say, they they've uh, they they did it all did a great job. We have to, um, I, I would have liked to have had a little bit more time so we could define some of the character designs with characters who, who carry over across the uh, the different mm -hmm. stories to to shape them a little bit closer to our. Our visions, but again, you know, we, it was, there was deadlines. We were up against it, and you know, it was a learning experience for for uh, us, I think, as much as uh, anybody else. But yeah, yeah, uh, and, was, Matt, I, I, and Matt seemed to be happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we live in very important of, of getting on his bad side, obviously. So you know, because we know what what he's like when he gets wild up and the knives come out. But uh, yeah, it was. Um, I, I think yeah, we think we. I don't think Matt regretted us. He, has, he hasn't let on that he's regretted picking us yet. Is, is, that, is that the uh, the kind of proof of the pudding? So long as there were no regrets. Then. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's still talking to me. I don't know about you, Maura, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm doing an Anderson, so I guess I'm okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually doing a, a, another Dread 2 part or so. We're mad, just, just actually in the middle of an email at the moment. Um but uh, yeah, so I think I think he he's forgiven us for any mistakes we might have made along the way. But, but let's let's talk a little bit about the characters because, like, like I said at the beginning, uh, 2008 has dabbled in crossovers in the past with uh, varying degrees of success. Um, yeah. You know, you, you go from everything from the, the the brief appearance of Dread in Low Life uh, in the, the early yeah. Low Life stuff through to the. Um, what was it, Prog 1000, when it was a, 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 a full prog story with Rogue Trooper and Dread and, and all this and other. Yeah, it was one of those ones, yeah. When, when, you're, when you're dealing with, with, with characters with so much history, within the context of where you're telling your story, um, does that create a challenge? Is, is, is that difficult to juggle when, when, you know, particularly, for example, Devil in War and, and, and Armitage, two characters with very particular personalities, very particular uh, backstories. And uh, although there is some crossover in the kind of stories that have been told about them, you'd think they, they almost operated in, in, in yeah. separate worlds. So, you know, was it, was it a challenge to, to, to have all this knowledge and backstory to these characters and then bring them together in a way that felt, and I hesitate to use this word, organic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It was a challenge, you know, in in a sense. And with with, with Armitage and, and Wall in particular, I went back. I didn't really go back and reread everything. We went back and read an awful lot to see how often their paths have crossed. And I was able to count the number of times their paths crossed on the fingers of one foot. It was not great. And I thought, but they're operating in circles. So I figured that for most of the stories, they're actually just standing back to back and they can't see each other. Um, I, I, I like to think that they I like to think that they basically they were aware of each other but they just hadn't met. But then when we wrote this, um, we come with the outline, it sort of it's, I decided, well, we let's just assume that they know each other. 
Because why wouldn't they? I mean, Britsit is not huge. I mean, I know Dev, Devin travels a lot and he wouldn't necessarily always be in Britsit, but it's not it's not huge compared to Mega City 1. Um, so let's decide that they know each other. Plus, of course, as we mentioned earlier, time passes in real time. Armitage hasn't shown up for a decade, apart from a brief appearance in uh, the Lion's Den back in 2016. And... Uh, so yeah, that was five years ago. So we thought, well, surely he wasn't just, you know, sitting around waiting for the phone call to ring and someone to say, hey, you've got an adventure. Um, so yeah, that plans cross. So it was easy enough. And actually, what was really impressive there, uh, um, when Liam Johnson's first um, script came in for uh, the Armitage and War story, it was like he'd been writing the characters for years. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that there's yeah. the, a lot of the onus of that story actually sits on Liam's shoulders because mm-hmm. the knack to write good dialogue between two quite different characters have it. Um, but I, I do think they're that perfect odd couple match where they bounce off each other because of the nature of their characters. But yeah, it is a, it is a challenge to 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 do that but you know you know they've at least heard of each other if they have not met each other yeah. and you as the writer go into this with that idea in your mind and Liam just like to be honest Liam did a fantastic job in in the, their interactions um and we were really happy with because that was actually of all of them, probably maybe it could have been the trickiest, yeah. but actually Liam's work came in so strong um, in the first draft that uh, after that, we're only talking about, uh, you know, uh, rough edges and, um, and tying things in and yeah. Um, and then with the other characters, yeah. One of the other big challenges is you want a special to kind of make sense on its own. And there is, the problem with 2000 AD is this giant legacy it carries with us and I, with it. I think a lot of people are intimidated by that to jump in, which is, of course, why 2000 AD has these jumping in issues a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, having characters talk about things uh, that the reader wouldn't necessarily get completely. You have to be careful about that. That's a line you're constantly um walking on 2000 AD because you know some of the fans are going to understand what you're talking about, the people who've been with it a long time, but you don't want to make it so obtuse that uh, someone's reading it going, what the, what the hell is this? At least you want to make it intriguing enough that they will go, oh, I need to read more of this. And then they go and buy more 2000 AD, which is ultimately what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's exactly it. Yes. Um, yeah, you, you, you really want the readers to, uh, the new readers, to feel that there's a way in. Because I, I've, I've found myself with American comics, uh, certain characters, I'm just going, I, I'd love to get into such and such, but I'm not going to go back and read 28 years worth of stories or whatever. So, yeah, but with um, with, with these specials, I think we did a good job. I, I think the trickiest one from that point of view was Inaba because um, she has her own history, and we just do the story has to allude to it, and um, it's not easy to kind of mm. to jump into a completely new culture. Um, so anybody coming in totally new, hopefully, will see okay, this is obviously it's in Japan or the future equivalent of Japan. It's got versions of judges over there, um, but it's it's got its own kind of flavor to the story. The judges are a bit more hardline in some respects, um, and we don't have. Uh, we were careful not to do cheapo tricks of having the uh, the characters talk about um, honour and samurais and stuff like that all the time because it's very easy to um, to slip into the, the shortcuts that are basically racist stereotypes. So that's it. We did have Armitage going to the pub. Hang on a second. Uh, <laughs> well, then there's actual facts. <laughs> yes. But um, I think so. That was, that was, was a tricky one. But I would love now to go to see if, if maybe that story and Abba in particular could open the way for a, a you know a series or something like that to say you know to, to see where she goes from there and how did she get to where she is actually and we um, and, and like we were constrained with page count we were told the page count and uh you know so I would actually have loved to have more pages for each of the individual 
uh, other artists, but we, the writers and artists, but uh, we literally didn't and, have the space. And, and we, so, we, we could have yeah. given up some of our pages so that they could have more pages. But you said, no, no, Mike, we're not doing that. And then you used all those horrible words. I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he's such a storyteller. <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we, there's a, there is a tradition of either 10 or, or a six page stories. Yeah. And, that was a restriction that we didn't have to stick to when you think about it. We could have yeah. gone beyond that. We could have said, no, no, we do nine and seven page stories. Yeah, that doesn't work, you know, yourself <laughs> with the math. Well, actually, it kind of doesn't work, actually, because stories should start on the right hand page. Yes, exactly. So then yeah. the, that way the reveal at the very end is on the, the left hand page. Mm. And that way you don't see it when, you know, yeah. So that's how it, it has to be an even number of pages. Secrets yeah. of the trade here. Uh, yeah. being, oh, uh, being, I talk about that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to come back to the, to, 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 to the start of the project and when you were conceiving of the idea uh, of, of, of this crossover and, you know, before you knew who was going to be working on it and, and um, before you, you, you'd been through that whole process, has the, has the, the final product delivered on uh, in the way that you hoped it would, that you expected it would, or, or has it in the making become something different? I, I, it's actually very close to what we originally envisioned, but better <laughs> because um, the individual writers did terrific jobs. Um, um, and, you know, we didn't have that in our mind. We, we only had outlines of that in our mind. And then the writers came in and we refined a little bit with them. But to be honest, they put in the major. they put in all the work. And, uh, you know, so... That's what you always hope. And then with the art coming in, you're always hoping that the art will be even better than you imagined, you know? So, um, so yeah, I would say this has been really, it's always a magical process to write a comic, in my opinion, because you have an outline which you are trying to give something very ineffable across to your artists, you know, and then when they do the goods, <laughs> you know, well, hopefully, but in this case they did, um, you, it's just for me, it's an uplift. Like every, there is nothing that gives me more of a thrill than seeing art coming in of a script I wrote. It's like things conjured into real life that started in my head or in our case, our heads, you know? And in fact, the other thing Mike and I talked about this is that I couldn't have written this comic this way on my own. Mike couldn't have written this comic, you know, that way on his own. The, the alchemy of working with other people makes everything better. And it's actually one of the brilliant things about collaboration. If you're work with the right team and the, everyone's working at the high level, then it elevates the project constantly. So that's what I, I hope for. And in this case, we were very lucky. The other thing we got was a very magical little key Matt gave us, which is called a lettering pass, <laughs> <laughs> which we almost never get. And we were very pleased because we were be able to tweak, uh, we were able to tweak a couple of things based on the artwork and uh, just to clarify here and there. And actually in one case, remove quite a bit of dialogue. <laughs> we were like, oh no, this is just too much. <laughs> What can we pull out at the last minute? And we didn't get much time on that. We had a very tight deadline on the lettering pass, which is fine. We were just very happy to get it. Yeah, that was that was, that was everything. It made us feel like we have more control than we would have otherwise. Because yeah, I, I always think of comic comic writing as um, I'm writing the story for the uh, artist and the colorist and the letterer. Their job is to put the story to the rest of the world. So the if if I mess up, they can fix it, um, or the editor will fix it. But um, we don't really, yeah. We it's kind of like we get a chance to push to, to get the ball rolling, but we don't get a chance to build the final snowman. This is talking mm -hmm. about snowballs in this case, or you know any other kind of ball that grows like that. Um, but we don't. Um, we kind of yeah. We we like we so we set it going, and then we come back at the end and go, oh, here's the finished comic. It's very nice to be able to go in and go, no, hang on, we can tweak this and just that. And there was a couple of cases where we, um, yeah, I think uh, this, the comics is a lot 
stronger because we were able to make a couple of tiny tweaks. One, one or two places, I think we tweaked, one place definitely we tweaked the art where we realized, oh, hang on a minute, this doesn't make sense because, mm-hmm. and then there was another case where the artist had, I'm going to say, to be political, I'm going to say, drew what he wanted to draw and not what he was told to draw. Um, or she, because I, I don't want people to know it was a him. But, <laughs> and it was gay, and the dialogue then didn't match because and I, it, it, it's, it, it, I won't go into the details, but the dialogue didn't match. But at first glance, it seemed fine. And I was reading it going, wait, wait, this doesn't, oh, I don't, yeah, no, I see what's happened. He's not done this. So we were able to tweak the dialogue then to make that all fit. And, and um, I, I defy anybody who isn't me or Maura or the editors or the artists to actually spot what that was. Because, well, they can't. <laughs> yeah. And also I can't remember. But um, <laughs> that was a case, we, we've never got that before. And I have occasionally with comics over the years had a case where um, the, the final product comes back and I go, oh yeah, well, I wish someone had spotted this in the editing stage now because this bit is wrong or that bit could have been better. So it was good. I, I would definitely love to have, to do that again, but we usually just don't have the time. And sometimes yeah. with, with Dread in particular, there's a very, very fast turnaround um, yeah. sometimes. I'm sure Matt does not want to give for the Prague writers a lettering pass. Like literally, can you just imagine trying to keep getting it back and then communicate it to the letterer? And the letterer doesn't often, like, and I, mean, I have to be very clear about this, is that I highly, highly respect letterers and I don't believe in, uh, you know, making their job dif- more difficult for them. Um, but, you know, uh, so we were very judicious in that. We didn't want to, to make things difficult. We were just trying to, usually uh, one of the things I like to do is if I do get a pass and I have on previous comics, it's just in 2018, the logistics just make it extremely difficult. Um, I have actually changed, I I remember a comic where I changed, I actually removed the dialogue in a page on a panel because the artist had gotten the expression of the character so good. I was like, okay, I don't actually need any dialogue here. And I said, please pull that off that page, that panel completely. And that's actually something I really like to do. But um, because, and the, or also reduce, if I can reduce dialogue, I always try to do that. But I try to do that on the script stage. That's like usually my last pass is like, how much can I take off? <laughs> because balloons cover up art and yeah. that's what you're trying to, sh- to give space for. Yeah, and brevity is there. <laughs> I think it's very important to <laughs> highlight. But yeah, the, um, when it comes to dread in particular, I, I would I would write the script and I'd go back over it and take out nearly everything he says. And not necessarily give the dialogue to other characters, but the less he says, the better. Because he doesn't he doesn't answer to anybody. He doesn't have to tell anybody anything. They can they you know they can find their own way. Um so occasionally I've seen stories by by other writers where Dredd has a nice big chunky piece of dialogue, and I'm going, no, 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 no. There's no way he'd be stick around long enough to say all this. Yeah. But that that's just my uh, my personal taste. Um what I particularly love is when we, when I, after managing a script from a, 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 a novice writer who's, um, who grew up um, learning to write scripts by reading Alan Moore scripts. Okay. And you go, oh, here comes a page and a half of description for one panel. That's great. Oh, there's 12 panels on this page. Oh, great. <laughs> um, brevity is very important. You have to, you have to learn uh, the John Wagner way where uh, uh, he would basically say, you know, panel one, or page two, panel one, dread, close up. And you go, that that's all you have to go with. So um, yeah, we uh, we need a, a happy medium, and I don't mean Doris Stokes on ecstasy, you know. <laughs> and you've already both mentioned um, that uh, this is something that you, you an experiment that you would like to repeat in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a, a difference? When when I say that 2008 has dipped its its toe in 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 the waters with with crossovers, of course there was Trifecta, which was the you know the first example of a gang of writers actually getting together to 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 to, to work that out. Um, is it a law of diminishing returns? Is is there a risk that that, that such things can can lose the potency of 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 the idea? 
Um, or uh, if you were to do it again, would you do it with fewer characters? Would you do it in a different way, bring in different universes or keep it in Dreadworld? Yeah, well, Trifecta was a very specific thing because they had, they had a, a the, the guys worked on, on that brilliantly and had a very specific goal, but they also had three separate ongoing stories. Um, I, I actually still regret to, to, to this day that, that Al Ewing told me what was coming up before I read it in the prog, because I would have loved that. But in this case, we knew we had limited stories, as in the... Um, the, the other stories were about six pages each and that was it. And there, there was no immediate um, follow-on. I think, um, yeah, because the Dread World stories have always had a kind of a twitch of crossover, like every now and again, Coburn shows up, this kind of thing. Um, it, it, this one didn't come as a great surprise to anybody. Uh, we, we were at the very beginning more and we did have the idea that we wouldn't tell anybody what we were doing people would assume they were separate stories and then when they got to the end they go hang on a minute this is the same guy he was in that one that kind of thing um, but that didn't prove to be workable uh, I, I don't think there is a diminishing returns problem because we know everybody knows that the dread world is linked all the stories that's why it's called that they're all connected I think if we suddenly brought in um characters from something else uh, that, that was unexpected. I mean, if we if we did bring in um, a kingdom or, or uh, I don't know, something else uh, like Proteus Vex. Oh, why did I think of that one? Um, <laughs> that would be a surprise. The readers wouldn't see that coming. But then, you know, that would be kind of cheating. We wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, you know? it depends on if you did it in a mega or in a Prague, you know? Mm-hmm. Like the, the structure of the story how it's being told and the medium in which it's being told will affect the, I know this sounds really boring, you know, but it, that actually, those permutations are the very first things you think about, like um, how they interact with each other. Like if you were going to have, um, you know, a series of Megs with a series, the same set of stories uh, interlinked, uh, or one following another over a series or doing them in the progs. All of that's going to affect how you do it. The other thing is if you're working with other art writers, you do have to have a meeting of minds, uh, as in everyone has to be okay to work together <laughs> and to not be trying to <laughs> out-jostle the other. And I, I don't think generally that would be a problem, but that is something, you know, everyone has to be on the same uh, the same goal, which is that, the story, the interlinked story lines will all work to a great conclusion. You probably need someone steering the ship because uh, in some fashion, it doesn't have to be like a dictator, but uh, because you do have to have, if you're going to do interlinked stories that with an overall satisfying narrative, you need a beginning and an end. You can do stuff in the middle, but um, you do need those two things. And uh, you do need agreement of all the writers to do those two things. Because if someone goes off piste in the middle, that is the, the domino effect for everyone else is going to be horrendous. So, you know what I mean? It's not, it's, uh, the spontaneity is actually quite difficult, uh, you know, to do in the 2000 AD universe. Um, but then deciding who you want to, what characters you want to use. I mean, the sky's the limit. You can do so much. There's so many great uh, characters out there. You could, you know, you could pull in. It's, I mean, there's so much potential, but it is a lot of extra work. And most of the writers will, you know, we are jobbing writers. We're given uh, X amount of uh, issues are, and then we do that job and then we move on and do other things, you know? So uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of constraints there. Yeah. I think what I mean, more, what more says, yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount of scope that you could do with, with the crossover thing because there, I did a quick calculation there recently. I think there's like 150, 140, 150 different, Dread World series have happened. Some of them are very limited, like the one-offs or, or here and there, but there's a huge amount. But it's been 40 odd years and uh, two publications plus all the annuals and specials and and poster progs and things like that. And we've never done Fuzzy Felt, but by God, we're getting there. Um, 
so there's there's a huge um, area. Uh, it, it basically, this is, is a sand pit with a lot of sand, and mm. most of it is irradiated, and there are scorpions. <laughs> but picking the right characters um, was really, I wouldn't necessarily pick the characters that that we picked if it had it been up mm-hmm. to me. Uh, again, that comes back to the fact that if I'd had a completely free hand. Yeah. And if, for example, if I was doing this alone without Mora, I would have chosen very different characters and it wouldn't have been as good. But because um, Matt basically said, we want Inaba, we want Chopper, we want Armitage mm-hmm. and uh, Devon Moore, we knew that Anderson and Dredd were a given. Anderson, well, Dredd because it's Dredd, Anderson was a given because of the nature of the story. Um, and that's, that, those restrictions are, 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 you know, are basically the framework, if you like, yeah. for yeah. the story. If we had a completely free hand, I would have, there's other, I don't want to spoil it, but there are other characters I was really keen to bring in, but they would have been the wrong characters. So with some of them in particular. Well, yeah, again, it's a kind of, um, uh, you know, chicken and egg scenario. Like once you know who you're using, everything adapts to that, you know? Mm. So, you know, we knew at the start the characters and then we adapted to that. Yeah. So... Uh, but yeah, so this is again comes back to the weird alchemy of uh, of creating these things. But yeah, c- comics are, as I've said many times, comics are very structured, really uh, technical things to write, and uh, you know, you're there's a lot of things you have to think about when you're creating them, uh, when you're writing them, um, and then you have to leave space for your artist to come in and do their amazing work, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, well, one thing that we always have to be aware of is that um, if we don't give the artists and, and the other, I see the visual creators, if you like, the artists, mm-hmm. colors, letters, yeah. um, the, the right kind of freedom that, and, and, and the ability to, to be flexible, then we're constraining them. And truly, the whole point of a visual medium is to emphasize the visuals. It isn't solely about the visuals, but they are telling the story. We can't if we do anything that kind of messes with that. That's um, that's a bad thing, you know. Our job is to, to curate them in the sense. So we work for the artists and the and the letters and the colorists. Hang on a second, but no, that is true though. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, great. That think- is. I mean, we've done an hour, so... What? Oh, great stuff. What else were you, are you working on, lads? <laughs> we okay. Well, let's, on. Let's, 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 let's go through that little formality. Now. <laughs> I mean, you, you've, you, you both really mentioned that um, you're working on more uh, 2000 AD stuff more. I think you said uh, uh, you're working on a, a new Anderson. Yeah, I've, um, uh, it will... It will pull on a thread from this story, you know, and... Uh, yeah, I'm literally on that this week. That's my that's one of my jobs <laughs> this week is to get that done um, and off to the artist. Uh, and that will be in the the autumn Meg, I believe. Cool. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, we'll work on two part dread at the moment. Um, just just nailing the story specifics down, and uh, yeah, hopefully I get that written by the end of the week. Beyond that, though, we've got a new series of Proteus X coming up. And just last night, the uh, uh, art for the first episode came in. And it was like, well, there's Jake Lynch on top form again. So that's Proteus X book three coming soon. And Dreadnought's book two, hopefully, will be coming soon at some point. Um, we'll say, what else have we got? Uh, You've got the novellas. The novellas. <laughs> hang on. Uh, yay. Judge is necessary evil. And coming very, very soon. What Measures Ye Meet by, look, C.E. Murphy, who is one of my favourite living writers after me and Maura. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there, there's, there's a fair bit coming up, so it's pretty good. We, we don't know yet whether or not we'll be getting a, an autumn special or a winter special or a late spring special or anything like that on the, on the heels of this one. But I imagine this, this new special will probably sell 400,000 copies in <laughs> <laughs> and, and at least yeah and they make a movie of it and everything like that well you know if we really if nothing if we didn't get to do this again it was nice to do it once it that's the way I look at it you know yeah and if we didn't get to do it again we, we can we can bask in the knowledge that we poisoned it for everybody else 
On that note. Uh, I, well, that's certainly one way to look at it, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, on that note. <laughs> that was actually a hint about the story, so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, true, actually. <laughs> You're so clever, Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to Maura and to Mike for that. If you want a copy of the 2000 AD sci-fi special, then either go along to your local newsagent or comic book store uh, where it should be stocked. Uh, if you can't get hold of a copy, there's always 2080.com or the 2080 app, which is available for Apple and Android devices. As I said at the beginning, we'll be back in seven days' time when we're going to be hearing our uh, interview from a few years ago with film director Ben Wheatley. Uh, seems like a perfect opportunity because um, uh, his new film, In the Woods, is uh, out, coming out. Um, so uh, it'll be great to hear that again. Uh, as always, if you want to give any feedback or any suggestions, fellcast at 2080.com. We shall see you in a week's time, athletes. Until then, stay safe. And Splendid Verthrick. Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! The 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.